Hello everybody and welcome to this A-level chemistry video about alkenes. In this video we will take a look at the structure and bonding in alkenes and its shape as well. We'll take a look at the reactions that alkenes undergo, paying particular attention to electrophilic addition. And we will finish by taking a look at addition polymerization and the different aspects of that. First of all, an overview of alkenes. Alkenes are hydrocarbons, which means that they are made from only hydrogen and carbon atoms, covalently bonded together, which means they share electrons. They are also classified as being unsaturated, and that is to do with the nature of the carbon bonds in the molecule. So alkanes are saturated, alkenes are unsaturated. And that means that they contain at least one double carbon to carbon bond, which we would generally represent with what looks like an equal sign between the two carbon atoms that share the double bond. And remember that a single carbon to carbon bond is a shared pair of electrons. And that's what makes a covalent bond, a shared pair of electrons. And in contrast, but following the same rules, a double bond is two shared pair, shared pairs of electrons. And what that means is instead of having two electrons in this space on here, alkenes have got four electrons in this space, which makes them electron rich. And it's this electron rich quality which means alkenes are much more reactive than alkanes. Alkenes are their own homologous series, and so they have a general formula. And the general formula for alkenes is CnH2n. And what that means is if we knew that we had two carbon atoms, which is the smallest you can get for an alkene, the number of hydrogens is double that, so four. And so this is ethene, the smallest alkene that there is. And if we had a larger alkene, C5, the number of hydrogens would just be double five, so 10. In terms of physical properties, the double bond doesn't really have much of an impact. And so the physical properties of alkenes are very, very similar to the alkanes. And by that, we mean that they are insoluble in water and that their melting point and boiling point increase with chain length. And if you remember the alkane video, that's because the van der Waals forces are stronger if the chain is longer. The shape of alkenes is a bit more complicated than the shape of alkanes because the double bonds and the region around the double bonds is planar, which means flat. And in fact, the molecule ethene is totally planar because all it is is the double bond and the region immediately around it. The easiest way to visualize the flat nature of the alkene is to imagine that you've got a piece of paper or a surface like this one and I've drawn it in three dimensions just so we can see that it's going to end up flat. And so what we end up doing is we put the carbon to carbon double bond in the middle and the bonds coming out of the other, other carbons, we try and put some perspective on them. So these ones are coming out towards us. So I'm drawing them as wedge lines because they're getting bigger the closer to us they get. Then the fourth bond, because remember carbon always has four bonds, is drawn going off into the distance with a dashed line. And the dashed line is most commonly drawn like this. There are slightly more complicated ways of doing this, but this one is absolutely fine. And if we're going to make this a drawing of ethene, remember ethene is C2H4, then all I'm going to do is put hydrogen atoms in each of the corners of this flat molecule. And you can see here on this picture the double carbon to carbon bond. And you can also see the bond angle more accurately represented than in a two-dimensional picture because we've got three clouds of electrons 
and they each repel each other to be as far apart as possible, which is 120 degrees in three-dimensional space. And so this bond angle is roughly 120 degrees. Although, in fact, because of the higher electron density here, the bonds over here, these two bonds, are likely to be pushed slightly closer together. So this is perhaps more likely to be 118 and this 121 for each of them. But for A-level chemistry, it's fine to consider all of these as 120 degrees. Now, the last quality of double bonds that I want to mention on this page is that they are fixed. In other words, they cannot rotate. And so that's called restricted rotation. And we'll look at why that happens on the next page. But as a consequence of that, the groups that are in these positions that I'm labeling here and the same on the other side, these are also fixed. Now that doesn't matter for ethene because they're all hydrogen atoms, but it does matter if those hydrogen atoms get replaced by another group. We have the same flat shape and we have the same fixed orientation. The reason that we get restricted rotation in alkenes is obviously to do with the second bond. The first bond in the alkene is called a sigma bond, and that arises when we have one electron from each of the carbon atoms, and that gets shared in what effectively looks like sort of a sausage shape. It's sometimes a little bit more stylized than that, but essentially what we've got is we've got two electrons in this sigma bond. And it's hard to draw this in three dimensions, but each of these two carbon atoms has also got sigma bonds to the two hydrogen atoms that they are bonded to. This leaves each of the carbon atoms with an unpaired electron in a p orbital. And remember, p orbitals are dumbbell shaped like this. And these p orbitals then overlap in a sort of similar way to how I'm drawing here. The atoms are probably closer together in practice. And then what this means is that the original electrons are no longer localized in the p orbital. They can be found somewhere within this pi cloud that I'm shading in here. So the two electrons are somewhere in this pi orbital. And as I say, it's sometimes referred to as a pi cloud of electron density. And it's this pi orbital, both above and below the carbon and carbon atoms, that mean that this bond can't rotate or twist around, and so these atoms are in fixed positions. I've dedicated two entire videos, one to isomerism and one to nomenclature, so I'm not going to go into great detail about those two things here, but I will give a brief summary. The first type of isomerism I want to mention is chain isomerism. This is shown with the first two examples. They're both alkenes, we can see that because of the double bond. But the longest chain that we can find is three. And so that makes this propene. But we have a methyl group on here, so we would call this methyl propene, technically all one word. Whereas in the second alkene that we've got, we have got a chain of four. So this becomes butene. And so we have methylpropene and butene that are chain isomers. But there is a second type of isomerism as well. If we compare the middle alkene and the end alkene, we can see that this end alkene is also butene. And so we need a way of telling them apart because they're definitely different because the double bond is in a different position. Here it's in the middle and here it's in the end. And these are in fact called position isomers because the double bond is in a different position. We name these by numbering the carbons, one, two, three, four. We number them to keep the numbers as small as possible. And so this is but one ene because the double bond is between the first and second carbon atoms. Whereas in the second alkene, it doesn't matter which end you start your numbering from, the double bond is between the second and the third carbon atoms here. And so to keep the numbers as small as possible, we call this but2ene. 
and so but1-ene and but2-ene are position isomers. There is a third type of structural isomerism, which is functional group isomerism, and alkenes and cycloalkanes are an example of a functional group isomer pair. And what that means is if we rearrange the atoms in the alkene into a ring, so I'll do this with butene, we end up with a cycle and we still end up with eight hydrogen atoms. But now we no longer have a double bond. So these are functional group isomers. As I say, these are all examples of structural isomerism, which is where molecules have the same molecular formula, but a different structural formula. The other type of isomerism shown by alkenes is geometric isomerism, or EZ isomerism. Now this is a subgroup of stereoisomerism, with the other type being optical isomerism, which you'll learn more about in year two chemistry. But2-ene is a good example of this type of isomerism. And you'll notice that the two structures that I've drawn here are both but2-ene. However, there is one distinction between each of these two, and that is that on the right-hand side but2-ene, the two largest groups are on the same side. They are together. On the left-hand side but2-ene, the two largest groups are on opposite sides. And this is where our E and our Z come from. The left-hand side but2-ene is called E but2-ene, and the right-hand side is called Z but2-ene. And this comes from the German Entgegen, which means opposite, and the two large groups are on the opposite sides. And the Z comes from the German Zutzamen, which does in fact literally mean together. And the two large groups are together on the same side. There is the occasional exam question that asks why something displays geometric isomerism. And there are two reasons. And the first is that we have got a double carbon to carbon bond, which has got restricted rotation. That means it can't twist. And so those large groups are in fixed positions, either together or on opposite sides. And the other reason is that we need to have two different groups or atoms on each carbon in the double bond. So to go back to another example from before, which was but1-ene, if we take a look at that, we can see that we've got the double bond. So we've definitely got restricted rotation. But on the left-hand side carbon, we've got two atoms of hydrogen that are identical. So we can't say that one of them is heavier and pair that with the ethyl group over here. It doesn't matter which way around these two are. They are both the same atom. So this one does not show geometric isomerism. One last bit about naming alkenes. The three inventors credited with deriving the system for naming alkenes are Robert Kahn, Christopher Ingolt and Vladimir Prelog. And so in light of this, we name the system after them. And that is the Kahn Ingold Prelog system, abbreviated to CIP for ease. And we could sum this up with one little sentence that I've got here. Priority with respect to naming is given to the atom with the largest atomic mass. And so an example here is this molecule that I've drawn. And if we look at the left hand side, it's really easy to see that since we've got hydrogen and fluorine, fluorine is obviously going to be the heavier mass of those two because the relative atomic mass of fluorine is 19 and hydrogen is one. If we look at the right hand side, we've got fluorine, which is 19 and we've got carbon, which is 12. And so once again, the fluorine is the heavier atom. And so this is going to be called Z because the two highest priority groups are on the same side, the same side. And so the whole molecule would be called 1,2-difluoropropene. And just to be clear, it is the mass of the first atom as we work our way out from the double bond 
And this is relevant here in this second example, not on the left-hand side. Once again, it's easy to see that fluorine is the heavier atomic mass here. And on the right-hand side, we've got chlorine with a relative atomic mass of 35. And this whole group over here has got a mass of 57, but it's not the mass of the whole group. That's irrelevant. The only thing that matters is the mass of the first atom connected to the carbon in the double bond, which is a carbon atom. So that would have a mass of 12. And so therefore, it is the chlorine that is the higher priority. And so therefore, this will be E as an isomer. And its name is going to be complex. It's hex one ene And we name this alphabetically. So actually, it's going to be 2-chloro- one fluoro hex one ene. Now you might have seen in old textbooks the nomenclature cis and trans and they match up to Z and E in the way that I've organized it here. However they're not always applicable. Cis and trans refers to when you've got two of the same groups on the same side and trans is for two of the different groups on different sides. So where cis and trans are sometimes appropriate, E and Z are always applicable. For instance, cis and trans would be inappropriate when talking about the groups on the right hand side because all of the groups around this double bond are different. And so we have to use E and Z. So I want you to appreciate what they mean, but I want you to use Z and E in exams. Now we're going to move on to take a look at the reactivity of alkenes. The first thing that we're going to look at is combustion. Now alkenes do burn and they produce carbon dioxide and water in the way that you would expect because carbon reacts with the oxygen to make carbon dioxide and the hydrogen reacts with oxygen to make water. But this is a really big waste of alkenes because they are so good at making other products that it would be a real shame to use them for combustion. Not only are alkenes too valuable to burn, they also don't burn very well compared to alkanes. They burn with what's called a sootier flame or a less clean flame. And the reason for this is the carbon to hydrogen ratio. The larger this carbon to hydrogen ratio, the sootier the flame. And so alkanes are cleaner because they have got a smaller carbon to hydrogen ratio. And as an aside, it's not quite an alkene, but the aromatics, such as benzene that we learnt about in the alkanes topic as one of the products of cracking, the aromatics, e.g. benzene, they burn with a very sooty flame because they've got the formula C6H6 and the carbon to hydrogen ratio is 1, which is much bigger than it is for alkenes and alkanes, and so they burn with a very sooty flame. I said it's a waste burning alkenes, and the reason is that they are so reactive due to that double bond. So this electron-rich double bond is very reactive, and one example of this is the reaction between alkenes and water, and this makes alcohols. And what happens is the double bond opens up and becomes a single bond and we've added water across that double bond. And as I say, this is used industrially to make alcohols, which we'll learn more about in the alcohols topic. But just to say now that this is not an easy reaction, so the water needs to be very hot, needs to be steam, so it needs a high temperature, high pressure, and we need to use a catalyst which is most commonly concentrated phosphoric acid. The most common reaction that alkenes undergo is electrophilic addition. An addition reaction is defined as where one molecule joins to another by forming a new bond and this ends up producing a larger molecule. An electrophile is derived in a similar way to nucleophile. So electro is from electron and electrons are negative and phile means seeking. So an electrophile is a negative seeking species. 
and the most likely thing to be negative seeking is a positively charged substance or a partially positively charged substance. And what it needs to be able to do is it needs to be a lone pair acceptor because what's going to happen is a new bond is going to form between there are three different electrophiles that you need to be aware of in the reactions with alkenes. There is hydrogen bromide or other similar hydrogen halides. There is bromine or really any halogen. And last of all, there is sulfuric acid. And then it's usually followed up by a reaction with water. When a hydrogen halide reacts with an alkene such as ethene, we end up making a halogeno alkane, such as this one. The chemical equation is useful because it gives us our overview, but far more useful than that is the mechanism for this reaction. Because mechanisms show us precisely how two substances react together, and they give us indications about the new bonds that form and the old bonds that break. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in red the curly arrows that you need to be able to draw in an exam, but I'm going to add extra explanations in green that are for your understanding rather than from the exam. First of all, because of the large electronegativity difference between bromine and hydrogen, we end up with a polar bond. And remember that alkenes are electron rich and electrons are negatively charged. So there is going to be an attraction between the positive part of the hydrogen bromide and the double bond. What happens is the electrophile attacks the double bond. And a new bond forms between one of the carbon atoms in the double bond and the hydrogen. Now hydrogen can't have two bonds, and so this bond needs to break. And the bromine takes both of the electrons from that pair. Which leaves us with a situation like this, where we have the bromine with both of the electrons from that covalent bond, and it's now negatively charged. And so we need to call this the bromide ion, because it's negative, it's no longer just simply bromine. And we also have got a carbocation, and a carbocation is a positively charged carbon atom, usually as part of a hydrocarbon. And the reason that it is a carbocation is if you think back to the double bond, this is four electrons, two electrons from each of the carbon atoms. And what then happened is that two of those electrons went away and formed this new bond that's over here. And so this carbon, which originally had a share of four electrons, has now got a share of two. And it originally put two electrons in from its own shell. And now it's only got three of its own electrons here, which is what leaves it as positively charged. Another way of thinking about it is that since the bromide is negatively charged, part of this molecule must be positive because overall the left hand side has got no charge. And so the right hand side must have overall no charge. And then the last thing that needs to happen in this mechanism is that the lone pair of electrons on the bromine must be attracted to the positive of the carbocation. And so we can curl our curly arrow any way we like. All that matters is the start and end points. And so our final product is this bromoethane over here, but I'm going to put it in brackets because rarely will you be asked to write that in an exam for a mechanism question. The electrophile is this HBr over here because it was seeking out the negative part of the alkene, which was the double bond, because it was attracted to the high electron density. And two electrons from that high electron density formed this new bond to the electrophile. In a recent video, I mentioned homolytic fission, and so I wanted to bring in its sort of opposite here. So when that hydrogen to bromine bond broke, this was heterolytic fission. And what that means is one atom in the bond takes both electrons. And in this case, it was the bromine that took both electrons. 
I want to take a look now at a slightly more complicated situation where the alkene is asymmetrical. In other words, it is not symmetrical. And the easiest one to choose is propene. And so if we bring our hydrogen bromide in again as the electrophile, the electrophile is attracted to the double bond. And the hydrogen is still slightly positively charged, and so it accepts a pair of electrons from the double bond and the bromine breaks the bond to the hydrogen heterolytically. This leads us to an intermediate stage in a very, very similar way to our first mechanism that we drew. And similarly, the negatively charged ion that we made is going to form a new bond to the positively charged carbon in the carbocation. And this is going to lead us to the halogenoalkane 2-bromopropane. Alternatively, but in a really similar way, the hydrogen could have formed a bond to the middle carbon in the original propene molecule, and the bromine to hydrogen bond would still break heterolytically. This leads us to a subtle difference in our carbocation intermediate, but the mechanism continues in the same way that you would expect, with the bromide being attracted towards the positive carbon in the carbocation and we make a different product on this occasion, and we make one bromopropane instead of two bromopropane. Now what's really important in exam questions is you need to know which of these is more likely, and the major product will be the two bromopropane, and the minor product will be the one bromopropane. In other words, what we mean by major product is that we'll make much more of it. And the reason that we make much more of it is to do with this intermediate stage in the middle where we had two slightly different carbocations. And the reason is that the top carbocation is more stable than the bottom carbocation. And the reason that the top carbocation is more stable is something called the positive inductive effect. And what that means is that the carbon atoms in the carbocation have a stabilizing effect on the positive charge. They push electron density towards the positive charge, thereby making it slightly more stable. And the top carbocation is known as a secondary carbocation. And the reason it's called a secondary carbocation is that there are two carbon atoms connected to the positively charged carbon. Whereas down here at the bottom, there is only one carbon atom connected to the positively charged carbon. So this is referred to as a primary carbocation. And it's a fact that you need to remember that secondary carbocations are more stable than primary carbocations. So, to review, the major product is the one that forms from the most stable carbocation intermediate. And carbocation intermediates follow the pattern that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary carbocation, and a secondary carbocation is more stable than a primary carbocation. And as you probably know, this is the symbol for tertiary, secondary, and primary. What does that mean, though, the stability of the carbocation? Now, stability is all to do with energy. So if we have an energy profile here, where energy is increasing up the y-axis, and we have some reactants down here, R for reactants, energy always has to go in to a reaction to make it happen. This is called the activation energy. And we end up at an intermediate stage. And so here is our intermediate carbocation. And let's make this a secondary carbocation, like in our previous example. So if we're going to make a less stable carbocation, what that means is more energy has to go in to actually produce it. And so a primary carbocation has more energy than a secondary carbocation, which is what makes this less stable, because it's got more energy. But in a reaction point of view, if we need to put more energy in to make it, then that's less likely to happen than 
something that requires less energy to go in to make it. And so the secondary carbocation forms far more readily than the primary carbocation because it is easier to make it because it requires less energy. So more stable can be thought of as meaning less energy and less stable means it needs more energy to make it. And that's why the more stable intermediate leads to the major product. And the less stable intermediate leads to the minor product. I've mentioned tertiary carbocations, but not drawn it on this graph. Tertiary carbocations are even more stable than secondary carbocations because they have got three alkyl groups providing the positive inductive effect. Like I say, they push electrons towards the positive charge, reducing it even more than a secondary carbocation does because there is a greater positive inductive effect. The reaction of alkenes with halogens, for instance bromine Br2, is very similar to the reaction between hydrogen bromide and alkenes. The big difference though is that the bromine electrophile isn't actually a polar molecule, it doesn't contain a dipole. However, due to random movements of electrons in the bromine molecule, at any one time this bromine could end up being partially positive and the other one being partially negative due to what's called an instantaneous dipole. So that means it's very short-lived and those polarities could reverse themselves. In addition to that, what we can also get is we can get this electron-rich double bond could repel the electrons in the bromine to bromine bond. And so we can have what's called a negative inductive effect where the electrons are repelled away from the double bond, which again makes this bromine partially positive and this one partially negative. And that relies on this orientation in the bromine as I've drawn it here, with one part of the bromine molecule being closer to the double bond, which means that the electrons will be pushed this way. And this induced dipole is more likely to be the cause of the pole in the Br2 and hence the reaction with the alkene. Thereafter, the mechanism is identical. The electrophile attacks the double bond and a new bond forms between the double bond and the bromine. This bond breaks heterolytically and we end up with a bromide ion. A carbocation intermediate forms along with the bromide ion and they attract each other. And so the third and final curly arrow is the formation of a new bond between the bromide ion and it's specifically its lone pair and the positive carbon, which leaves us with a dihalogenoalkane with one bromine on each of the carbon atoms that originally contained the double bond. This could happen in the exact same way with Cl2, Br2, I2 or F2 in terms of an exam question. So you need to be prepared to write this mechanism out in the exact same way for any of these using the red arrows as I've shown here and remarking upon, if prompted, the fact that a dipole is caused to happen due to the repulsion from the double bond. This reaction of alkenes with Br2 is exactly the chemistry where you test for unsaturation. So if you had an alkene in here with some bromine water, and bromine water is yellow, so I'll draw bromine water in the bottom and let's assume it's an alkene that's quite small, so we'll put a bung in the top because alkenes are gases when they're small. If you give this mixture a very good shake, and you keep shaking and shaking and shaking, over time what will happen is that the bromine water will decolorize, or if you're asked for the colour change, it goes from yellow to colourless, not to clear. We must say colourless. And the chemistry for this reaction is if we use ethene, ethene plus bromine turns into CH2BrCH2Br, not C2H4Br2, because that is too ambiguous for our purposes here, because both of those bromines could technically be on the same atom in this formula, 
Whereas here, we're making it absolutely clear that one bromine adds on to each of the carbon atoms that had that double bond in the first place. The final electrophilic addition reaction that you need to know about is the reaction with sulfuric acid. In the same way as the other two, this reaction takes place at room temperature. However, a big difference in these two reactions is that this one is incredibly exothermic. So in other words, a lot of heat energy gets given out and the temperature will definitely rise. The overall reaction produces a chemical called an alkyl hydrogen sulfate. And in this instance, the example that I've drawn where ethene was my alkene, the chemical's name would be ethyl hydrogen sulfate. And that's because this is our ethyl group and this is our hydrogen sulfate group on there. And the mechanism proceeds in the exact same way as the other two. In sulfuric acid, H2SO4, the oxygen to hydrogen bond is polar, with the oxygen being more electronegative. And so the electron-rich pi cloud around the alkene is attracted to the hydrogen atom. And so the electrophile attacks the double bond in the same way as before, and the oxygen to hydrogen bond breaks heterolytically. In the same way as before, we get two charged intermediates. On this occasion, there is only one option for the carbocation, so it doesn't matter where I put my positive on either of these. But remember, the positive inductive effect and carbocation stabilities means that that might matter if it's a asymmetrical alkene originally. But in this occasion, it's nice and straightforward. The hydrogen sulfate ion is going to attack the carbocation, and we're going to end up with the ethyl hydrogen sulfate. And I'll just draw the arrow pointing up there because remember, in mechanisms, you don't need to draw the final product. One last thing to mention about this reaction is that we can take our ethyl hydrogen, which I've shown again here in black, and we can react it with water, and we end up with an alcohol being produced. And interestingly, we end up with our sulfuric acid back. And so if you do both of these one after the other, the sulfuric acid is in effect acting as a catalyst because it was there at the beginning and it's there at the end. And so the overall effect is to add water across the double bond, but water wouldn't be attracted to the double bond because it's a nucleophile, not an electrophile. And so the sulfuric acid was needed to react with that double bond in the first place, but then it gets regenerated and so it's provided this alternative pathway, which again is what makes it a catalyst. Polymerization is the production of polymers. And polymers are very large molecules built up from small molecules called monomers. The name polymer means many parts and monomer means one part. So lots of small molecules called monomers join together to make a large molecule called a polymer. Now, polymers occur naturally in many different places. For instance, starch is a polymer found in our foods, like pasta. Protein is a polymer that makes up significant parts of our bodies. Cellulose is a polymer found in cell walls of plants. And DNA is a polymer that is absolutely essential to life in all living things as we know it. And then there is a different type of polymer known as synthetic polymers or made by humans. And the first synthetic polymer was Bakelite made in 1907. And synthetic polymers can be broadly characterized as plastics, but also we've got synthetic fibers. And the type of polymerization that alkenes undergo is called addition polymerization. You might remember either from biology or from GCSE triple chemistry, that there is another type of polymerization called condensation polymerization, but that's something for year 13 chemistry. And so overall, what happens is the alkene, which is unsaturated because it's got its double bond, turns into polyalkene, which is saturated because it has no longer got a double bond. And so an example of this would be ethene 
or lots of ethene were joined together to make polyethene. And in spite of the name, it's saturated, and so it doesn't have a double bond, even though its name ends in ene. So that can be quite misleading. And so polyethene and any alkenes, because they have not got a double bond, they are therefore unreactive. And so another example might be if we have lots of propene and we end up making polypropene, which again would be a saturated polymer, and so it would be unreactive. Whilst it's definitely the case that polyalkenes are not very reactive, they do have a very high melting point. And the reason for this is that they are very, very long molecules, and so as such they have very high numbers of van der Waals forces, which is what holds these polymer chains together. The longer the chain, the larger the strength of the van der Waals forces, the higher the melting point. I want to take a bit more of a detailed look now about what happens when the monomers polymerize. If we take these three ethenes as an example, we're going to make polyethene from them, although this would of course happen on a bigger scale with thousands of ethenes. The important thing to remember is that this double bond in the middle of each of these ethenes is four electrons. And so what happens in each case is that the double bond opens up and they open up partially and they become single bonds. And so we end up with, and each carbon in the double bond has a spare electron now because this double bond has opened up. Now this doesn't last for very long, less than a fraction of a second because this is so, so reactive. But what I hope you can see can happen now is that the single bond that each atom of carbon has got is now going to join together to form a new bond. And so now our three ethene molecules are joined together and this chain can grow and grow and grow from the ends. So where originally we had three separate ethenes, the double bond opened up, leaving the carbon atoms with a spare electron each, the ones from the double bond, and then those carbon atoms with the spare electron joined together to make the polymer, polyethene. Now, because all of that took quite a lot of time and effort, there must be a quicker way. And this is what we're going to look at now, how you write equations to show polymerization. So first of all, we have our monomer on the left-hand side. And notice that the bonds are at a slightly strange angle. They're not shown at the 120 degree angle that they truly should be. And that's because it, it shows us how we're going to form the polymer. So we have got n lots of our monomer, and they form into the polymer. And to show the transition from monomer into polymer, you need to do three things. First of all, the double bond between the two carbon atoms is changed, and it becomes a single bond. And secondly, you need to show the side chains or anything else in exactly the same way as before. And then you need to represent that this is a repeat pattern that's going on and on and on and on by drawing trailing bonds from the sides and putting brackets around it. And then because we have got n lots of these monomers all joining together, we will have n lots of this repeating unit. You must show this n if you've been asked to show the structure of a polymer. You must not include it if you've been asked to show the formula of the repeat unit. And the repeat unit is what is inside the brackets. And unsurprisingly, it's called that because it repeats many, 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 many times. N times, where N is a huge number. And so the repeat unit is the thing that repeats many times, and the polymer is the repeated unit that has repeated many times. And that's a really subtle distinction. So importantly, if you're showing the polymer, you include the N. If you're showing the repeat unit, you don't have to include the N. And in fact, you don't have to include the brackets either for the repeat unit. But if you do include the N and you've been asked for the repeat unit, you won't get it. So you only include the N for the polymer. Now, just to show two more examples, just so we can see how easy this is, 
we've got here two alkene monomers. We have tetrafluoroethene at the top because there are four fluorine atoms joined to ethene. And we've got phenylethene at the bottom because we've got this benzene ring, which is called a phenyl group, attached to the ethene. But this does have a more common name. This is actually called styrene. And without drawing this, the polymers that we're going to make are poly tetrafluoroethene and polystyrene, or, or polyphenylethene. And remember those steps for showing this polymerization. Step one, redraw everything exactly how it was, except we lose the N from the front and the double bond becomes a single bond. So it doesn't matter how complicated it is, it doesn't matter what those groups are off to the side, could be a big long carbon chain, could be a benzene ring, doesn't matter. We've done stage one, then we draw the trailing bonds out to the outside, then we draw the brackets, and then because I'm showing the polymer, I'm going to put the N. Same for the bottom, carbon to carbon becomes a single bond. Redraw those substituents exactly as they were, and then stick the trailing bonds out of the sides and put the brackets around it and add the N. And that's it done. And notice you can see from these diagrams that these are now saturated molecules. There is no double bond there anymore. It might be that you are asked to consider a section of a polymer and work out what monomer this must have formed from. This is usually not too difficult because you need to remember that the monomer must contain at least two carbon atoms and each monomer only contributes two carbon atoms to the chain. And so what that means is this must be one of the monomers. Because if we reconstruct and work backwards, the monomers must have contained a double bond and it's those two carbon atoms that form the carbon skeleton. And so the other parts of the monomer must have been what is now considered to be the branch parts of the polymer. And so we must have had n lots of this monomer here, which would have been polypropene as the polymer and propene as the monomer. They could have made this question a little bit more tricky if they'd made it so that the polymer was not a consistent repeating pattern. If you think about it, there is no real reason why all the monomers should line up in exactly the same order. And what I mean by that is if we consider the first example, we've got carbon A here and carbon B. And this is lining up in an A, B, A, B, A, B sequence like that. But there's no real reason why they would. In fact, you'd be likely to get a jumble. And if we take a look at the polymer at the bottom, we have still got the exact same monomer, where if you look at the first one, we've got carbon A, then carbon B. And then what happens is the monomer reverses its order. We then go B, A, and then we go A, B. So we have, in fact, got the exact same monomer making two different polymers. It's just that the monomers are not always joining sort of front to back. They're alternating whether the branched carbon sometimes joins straight away or sometimes it's the unbranched carbon that joins onto the previous monomer. And remember, of course, that where carbon atoms in the polymer have got side chains or substituents, the monomers must have these substituents as well. The properties that polymers have depend greatly on the monomer that you use to make it. This is obvious. What's less obvious is that you can change the properties of polymers both as they form and once they form. For instance, chemicals called plasticizers force the polymer chains apart slightly, which allows them to slide over each other more, and this makes polymers more flexible. A really good example of this is polyvinyl chloride, or PVC for short. Now, this is actually an old-fashioned name. You can work out what the monomer must have been by taking that single bond and turning it into a double bond and adding the substituents in the same way that we did on the previous page. And so that means that the monomer must used to have been called vinyl chloride, which it was, but its more modern IUPAC name would simply be chloroethene. 
and so polyvinyl chloride should really be called polychloroethene in terms of a modern name. Now this polyvinyl chloride is an example of the good use of plasticizers because without plasticizers PVC is used for drain pipes but with plasticizers PVC can be used for aprons. That's a significant difference in flexibility. One of them is a nice rigid structure for, uh, that's used for strength. The other has, amongst other properties, the property of flexibility. Another polymer that can have dramatically different properties is polythene. You'll notice I say polythene because that is the common name, although strictly speaking, it should be polyethene. There are two main classes of polythene. There is high density polythene and low density polythene. Remember, density tells us the mass a substance will have for a particular volume. And low density polythene is used for plastic bags and also for the insulation on electrical cables. Whereas high density polythene is much more rigid and so it's used for crates and buckets and bottles. So LDPE has got um, greater flexibility and even the capacity to stretch, whereas the HDPE is more rigid and more strong and it's also got a higher melting point too. And the only difference between these two polymers in terms of their chemistry comes from the conditions that the ethene monomers were subjected to as the polymer was formed. So they're both made from ethene, but HDPE uses a low temperature and a low pressure, just a little bit above room temperature and atmospheric pressure, but it uses a catalyst called a Ziegler-Natta catalyst, which is named after the scientists that developed it. And the result is we get polymer chains that have very little branching. And as a result, they pack together very, very nicely. I'm just using zigzag lines to represent the polymer. Whereas the low density polythene forms from a much higher temperature and pressure, and it forms using a free radical mechanism, which is much more aggressive. And as a result of this aggressive mechanism, the polymers are often branched because they break in various places as they're forming. And so as a result of this, the polymers can't pack together so closely because we end up with the branches that keep the polymers apart. And that's why they are lower density because the chains are further apart. The final property I want to look at is the biodegradability of a polymer. Now biodegradability is the ability of a substance to be broken down by biological agents, for instance enzymes, but it doesn't have to be enzymes. We might be referring to just simply water in a natural environment breaking something apart. Now remember, in spite of their name, polyalkenes are saturated, and because they're saturated they are unreactive, and not only are they unreactive, they are non-polar. As a result of all three of these things, they are non-biodegradable, which means that they are not able to be broken down by biological agents, which does create the problem of how are we going to get rid of these polymers? Do we burn them, which might cause problems with releasing harmful chemicals into the air, or do we put them into a landfill, which might over time release tiny particulates into the soil and then ultimately into the water system? So definitely a problem that needs careful consideration. We're going to finish up by looking at two environmentally friendly methods of disposing of plastics. Now obviously we can reduce the amount of plastics that we use, or we can reuse plastics that we've finished using. And the third R is, of course, recycling, and that's what we're going to be looking at now. And there are two types of recycling that we're going to look at, the mechanical recycling and the feedstock recycling. 
Mechanical recycling is the most common because it's the simplest. The first step is to sort the plastics into different types. And the second step is to wash the plastics to get rid of any contaminants that might be on the surfaces. And then they get ground up until they form little pellets. And then last of all, these pellets are melted and remolded. And you can now get completely recycled soft drinks, bottles, and also clothing made from recycled plastic. In feedstock recycling, what you do is you heat the polymers. And you heat the polymers to a temperature that breaks the bonds between the polymers and it reproduces the monomers that the polymer was made from. And then these monomers can then be recombined in different conditions to make new polymers. The problem with these methods of recycling plastics, particularly ones that involve a lot of melting of the plastic, is that the more times you melt plastic, the more you can break the chains within the polymer and damage it and therefore degrade some of the plastic's properties. This means that the plastic might not be as useful if you've recycled it four or five or more times.